I've been making these not very deep, deep dive videos for a few months now. I've made a few of them involving Estee Lauder companies, the brands within the Estee Lauder umbrella. And looking at comments, a lot of you have a lot of mixed feelings when Estee Lauder purchase a brand or have any kind of involvement in it. You all seem very disappointed and as though Estee Lauder has kind of messed it up in some way. And as I thought deeper about this and looked into a little bit more and read some of your comments, I'm like, you're all right. Something feels when Estee Estee Lauder purchase a brand, something feels wrong. Everything goes downhill, something happens. It's almost as though the brand gets cursed. I also read a lot of comments from all of you that say that Estee Lauder ruined your favourite brands or are ruining your favourite brands and I would love to know the exact reason why I would love to have that discussion with you down below. So today we are going to be looking at some brands that have been negatively impacted in some way by Estee Lauder, touched by the curse of Estee Lauder you could say. I do want to put a trigger warning right here for drug use and which will be at the end of today's video. Just before we get into this video, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up. Follow me on TikTok and Instagram for beauty content you won't see here on YouTube. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, Essay Lauder is kind of like an umbrella brand. Like L'Oreal, it has many different brands within its clutches. So it's not only its own brand, Essay Lauder, but it's also an umbrella brand. It has different makeup brands, beauty brands, fragrance brands within its umbrella, including MAC, Bobbi Brown, Aveda, Origins, Bumble and Bumble, Tom Ford Beauty, Jo Malone, Aramis, Dr. Jar, Too Faced, Creme de la Mer, goes on, it goes on <laughs> and on. So Estee Lauder are quite notorious for buying up brands, purchasing them, acquiring them, whatever you want to call it. In fact, between 2014 and 2016, Estee Lauder purchased seven brands all together. It's quite rare when big brands purchase a brand and see something in a brand that they want. So for Estee Lauder to purchase seven brands within four years, is a lot. They've purchased these brands for millions, hundreds of millions, even a billion on the rare occasion. Brands that they see to be highly profitable. And this was the case for our brands we're going to speak about today, who were touched by the Estee at Lauder curse. But if Estee Lauder thought these brands were so profitable, what went wrong and why were they kind of ruined? Why do big conglomerates like Estee Lauder shut down brands that they once saw as being a money mine for them? Or why do they make them like purchase online or only available in one certain country. So according to an article by Rachel Struger, so this is from businessoffashion.com, didn't know that was a thing. She says in this article that of course a brand not making the sales that they were expecting to is, is quite a big part of why a brand was shut down. But it's also not about how the brand is performing right now in this moment, like how many sales did they make this month? How many sales did they make this year? It's also about where they see the brand, like let's say in five years time. What is that brand's five year plan? Does it add anything to the umbrella of companies that another brand can't supply or can't give? What makes it unique? What makes it different that we still need to invest money into it? Why shut down these companies and not just resell? Like they purchase a brand in the first place, right? Why not sell it? Maybe at a loss, but why not also gain a couple of million, you know what I mean? Well, that would just be giving iconic formulas away, right? Let's say you have a brand. Let's take Becca, for example. I did a whole video on why Becca shut down and all this and how they shut down. But Becca had their iconic formulas, champagne pop highlighter, right? And their under eye correctors. Why would S.A. Lauder give away or sell those iconic formulas for, let's say, a couple of million when they can just move it over to another brand with those formulas and keep that formula, those ingredients, that secret formula, I guess it's not so secret, within their company. They can keep an iconic formula known around the world within their brands rather than let another company have it and profit maybe millions and millions and millions from that formula. It's theirs, you know? It's like um, an heirloom. So let's start with our cursed brands, with a brand that they actually did exactly this to. I always need to look at the name of this. Rodin Olio Luso. I've also never heard of this brand. <laughs> so Rodin was a fashion stylist. That was their main job for three decades, 30 years. Rodin Olio Luso was launched in 2007. And that brand became so um, successful that became the primary focus. So this brand was one of those like, oh, it's natural, kind of like body oils, face oils. My name is Jessica and I'm an entrepreneur. My beauty philosophy is more is more or the most is the most. If I could, I would just douse myself in rodent oil all day long, but 
My favorite way of using it is after the bath or a shower when your skin is still a bit damp and it really helps the oil absorb. You just get to kind of like waft around in that amazing smell all day. Jasmine and neroli oil is my favorite one. I love it, oh my God, it smells so good. Maybe two or three drops. Warm it up with your hands a bit and to smell it like 50 to 60 times while you're applying it. Pat it quite gently into your skin. It's quite nice to just put it right here. It's sort of calming. See, that's the thing, it's so amazing. It's unbelievable, look how much I'm glowing. Luxury, it was luxury. This brand, this oil must have been so amazing. It cost $170. I don't believe that a face oil could be worth that much. Sorry. It did win an Allure Best of Beauty award, so that's kind of good. But the brand also did like um, hair oil, did they? Did I make that up? Yeah, they did. Hair oil, um, body oil, soap, lip balms, like that kind of thing, like that kind of moisture, oil everywhere kind of brand. Oh, and, and fragrance. So usually when Estee Lauder like buy a brand, they're kind of like, we purchased it for 10 million because we see the, you know, the, how, you know, how great it is as a brand and the possibilities with this brand. No one said a thing, not either side per mentioned how much it was purchased for. Now, I don't know about you, but that says to me, it was either purchased for way too much, <laughs> or way too little. But if Estee Lauder was purchasing your brand and you were still profiting from it, I would kind of, you know, it's Estee Lauder. You would kind of let them take the reins a little bit, right? And trust them. So Rodin did stay on and, um, you know, kind of took the reins as creative director. This brand wasn't big by any means when Estee Lauder purchased it. Usually they will look at a brand and be like, hey, this this brand made tens of millions, hundreds of millions last year. What? How can we make even more? This brand sales were only around 5 million. Which I say only, I would be pretty happy if I made five million from the brand. But this at the time was kind of like this new strategy from Estee Lauder to purchase smaller brands that perhaps weren't worth millions and millions and millions yet, but could possibly be in the future. So, you know, get it while it's hot kind of thing, but not too hot room temperature. So I mentioned that this ties into Estee Lauder repurposing brands and formulas that they closed down like they did with Becca and Smashbox. So some products, iconic products from Becca moved to Smashbox and it's like Becca by Smashbox, you know? I guess Estee Lauder couldn't see anything else happening with this brand despite purchasing it for an undisclosed amount and, and thinking what else they can do with it. It's quite unique, like this oil elixir as a brand. I think they could do a lot of it. Creme de la Mer have their overpriced elixirs and stuff like that, you know? So I guess it's not so unique. You know what I mean? They could have done, I feel like they could have done more of it. I certainly never heard of it. What they didn't do is take a brand with a cult following and make it like an everyone following a household name. They really missed the mark on that. But what they did do is after they shut it down, they teamed up with Joe Malone. So Joe Malone is the fragrance company. They do like hand creams and stuff like that also. And this was kind of like the answer to like Joe Malone skincare. They introduced these oils from Rodin, what was it called? Rodin Oleo Luso into the Jo Malone brand. So you can actually still go on some places that sell Jo Malone, Selfridges, for example, here in the UK, and find the Jo Malone and Rodin Oleo Luso oils on their website. And they're still selling it as their Jo Malone dives into skincare. Here's what Selfridges has to say. Jo Malone is famed for its sumptuous collection of fragrances and colognes. I would say colonies then for you and your home. But the British house is dipping its toes into the world of skincare with its latest collaboration. The Jasmine and Neroli body oil hails from the limited edition capsule with skincare authority Rodin Oleo Luso, created from a love of unique treasured ingredients, olfactive clarity. I don't know what that means, olfactive. This oil envelops skin for a velvety soft finish and uplifting sensual experience, sensorial. I feel like they really let that brand slip out of their hands and almost like the effort wasn't there. And I think if they find a way to repurpose it, they're just going to go ahead and shut it down. But could this be an issue with buying smaller brands that aren't actually making millions and millions and millions? Maybe people don't, maybe there's a reason. I don't know. Let's move on. Prescriptives. Now, if you're really, really young, <laughs> you won't remember Prescriptives. Prescriptives was a really cool brand. I, I loved the look of it. I never tried it. I wasn't in my makeup era then, like makeup on me. But I thought it was a really cool idea. And I remember seeing the counter in very select department stores in the UK, like quite high-end ones. This brand was really a creation off Estee Lauder, right? So in 1979, Estee and Leonard Lauder, who are up there in Estee Lauder, because it's them. It's quite literally Estee Lauder. Created prescriptors. They wanted something completely different to what was happening in department stores on the market, where you can get very specific products, right? Made 
for you. So they asked Cindy Shantakai, if you recognize that name, it's because it's the same person who went on to create Shantakai Cosmetics, but that brand wasn't around yet. But they, they reached out to her to help formulate some products for this company that they wanted to make prescriptives. Come up with a formula, come up with a way to like match these foundations to people. She made this way of matching your foundation. Prescriptus was, you could definitely find your foundation. It was guaranteed you would find your foundation shade because they had a way of matching it by drawing like undertones on your face of like these crayons almost, face face ones, and it would lead you to get the perfect match of your foundation. At the time, this was incredible for people with deeper skin tones who couldn't find their match within the beauty industry you are gonna find it right here. But what they were really known for was a custom blend. And this was foundation. So you could make your own foundation. You could have it full coverage, light coverage, medium coverage. You could have it um, glowy or matte. You could have certain ingredients within it. You could have your own custom color made. It was so incredible. And they also did this with powders and lipstick and so on. Imagine going to a store and having something so custom made to you. And, and then they save it on file. So they save all effort so you can just go in there and get it again. It's perfect. This would have been so, so good for nowadays. It was very much ahead of its time. It shut down in 2010, but they kept like stock in stores and then people who they had um, deals with, whatever, they kept the, store, the stock with them until it sold out. So you could get it online for a limited amount of time. And then some retailers, but not like a prescriptive counter, for example. Perhaps Essay Lauder at this time struggled to uh, market something like this. I think it will do so well now. It was even better than like, you know, like Il Maquillage who make you do a whole, um, quiz when they actually only sell one foundation at this point in time. It's, it wasn't like that. It was down to every single detail. It would do so amazing now. I wish, I wish, wish, wish that would come back. Okay, let's talk about Smashbox. And I'm going to add in that trigger warning again here for you from the beginning. So Smashbox was created in Smashbox Studios. <laughs> which is, was like a studio and then they created a makeup brand in 1996 in LA. That's very much like what Milk did, Milk Studios, then made a makeup brand also. And this was actually um, founded by Dean and Davis Factor, who are the great grandchildren. Yeah, great grandsons of a legendary makeup artist, Max Factor, the actual guy himself. I didn't realize they've been around for that long, but in 2022, Smashbox, who were owned by Esso Lauder at this time, announced that they were ceasing all sales in the UK and Ireland, in stores and online, and would no longer be shipping to um, any of these countries from September of that year. Nothing was really said about why they were doing this, and to be fair, it wasn't like the brand was a big deal in the, here in the UK. It was very confusing what kind of level Smashbox was on. In my opinion, the, the quality of a product didn't match the prices. They were drugstore quality products with like mid to high end prices. There was a, I owned an eyeshadow palette from them, which was really nice. It was like, use it wet and dry, but the price it was, I got a discount obviously being a part of Estee Lauder companies, but it just, it wasn't, it wasn't that good. I don't know why it was so pricey. So regarding the stopping of sales in the UK and Ireland, a spokesperson said, for Estee Lauder. Over recent years, Smashbox's UK sales have been impacted by changes in the brand's retail space and location, combined with competitive challenges, and we have had to make a difficult decision to cease selling the brand in the UK and Ireland. Smashbox will continue to sell in various other markets around the world. The Estee Lauder Companies is committed to ensuring that it's focused on investing its resources into the most strategic long-term growth opportunities and value creation globally. I lost, I just read that without even thinking about it in my mind. And um, the brand was actually launched in 1998 in the UK and it had the most horrific start. It was awful. So a report by The Guardian put out there that a public relations person involved in Smashbox was actually 
drugs and raped by a friend of Dean and Davis Factor at the launch event for this brand in the UK. And this basically resulted in, and rightly so, the UK beauty press not giving this brand any attention and any love. And of course, then Smashbox really struggled to get, make a name for themselves in the UK and get their name out there as people weren't talking about it because they didn't want to. And had I known about this before researching this, I wouldn't have used their brand altogether. There are other companies that have closed down with in Essay Lauder, and they include um, Becca and actually a whole fragrance division that they had as well. They didn't continue their contracts and just let them kind of go. But you know what I think is next for Essay Lauder? Glam Glow. Did you know Glam Glow are still around? I didn't. Have you ever experienced <laughs> the feeling of having your skin burnt or ripped off by a wonderful Glam Glow mask. It is, oh, you must. Glam Glow actually followed in another footsteps of um, Smashbox in terms of they weren't selling within the UK and Ireland anymore. They made a very um, similar statement to the one they did for Smashbox. Although you can still get Glam Glow on the TK Maxx website here in the UK and also on Amazon. I just think it's very outdated Glam Glow as a brand. I think they have this, you know, if it tingles, it's working at kind of view on products. They are very, very harsh, harsh products. They have a very 80s, 90s mind frame and they actually just do a load of masks. I actually, honestly, I used to love them. I used to buy like the little packs and do each one. I'll be sitting there with my face burning and my eyes burning, but oh my God, it's working. Terrible, terrible products. And I also do think Smashbox will be on its way out after that. I would love to know your opinions below. As always, thank you so, so much for joining me consider subscribing and for more videos like this go ahead and click right on this playlist here i will see you very very soon bye